He is one of the top economists of India. He worked in America, probably for the World Bank or IMF. He was in the planning commission in India. He was the vice chancellor of a uh, leading university, Pune University. And with these kind of skills, he was able to rewrite his whole autobiography. There's a transference of sensibility. It's not that rough, easygoing narrative that does not have a certain coherent pattern of structure and things like that, but it has a pretty well uh, designed structure and uh, the English also is very good. I think probably Dr. Jadav may have taken help from others and had it very well edited and as a result, it's a very polished work ultimately. This of course has its advantages uh, because it reaches out in a, to a much wider audience, especially to a foreign audience. And this book, which in French is called The Untouchables, has actually been uh, translated into, I think, more than 15 or 20 uh, languages, including Korean and other languages, and sold millions of copies. So it's the uh, translated book as such. But in my words, it's not exactly a translation. It's basically rewritten, more in uh, keeping in mind the modernist sensibilities. Of course, Jadav in an interview has said, I quote him, Firstly, Marathi can't be translated. And secondly, the social context of the book was very relevant to the Marathi audience. When I was writing the book, I had to make it whole to suit the global reader. So there are these kind of difficulties and there are also certain socio-political dimensions which, which come into uh, being when you are writing the literature. Just to mention Meena Kandasamy, who is not exactly Dalit, but she is uh, from a lower caste, who has written The Gypsy Goddess, apart from being a very well-known poet. But again, The Gypsy Goddess, a very powerful book, the narrative style, the English, is not really accessible, say, even to the present uh, Dalit English reader. The new generation of Dalits who are studying in English, who are becoming engineers, they would not be able to really appreciate the kind of literature the kind of style of the Gypsy Goddess. So reading these texts politically, we would find that uh, India is in a social setup which many people call neo-colonial, or at least the influence of neoliberalism is what is uh, in, uh, in the present Indian society. And how do we deal with this whole question of English in that society? So if we remember Googie's uh, decolonizing the mind, we are reminded of the number of times Googie has talked about the importance of writing in the mother tongue. And he's argued that even um, trying to express oneself in a foreign language, language is a vehicle of culture, he has said. And it's very difficult to express oneself in a foreign language. And for the entire generation of Africans who have written in French, who have written in English, have had an ambivalent relationship with that, with the language of the colonizer. So will this form another subcategory in Indian writing in English? Will there be a Dalit Indian English writing? You know, so these are the various questions that came to my mind, which I thought I would share with you. The stories not only entertain, but also help the Lombardas to pass on their history and criticize those in power. The oral tradition of Lombarda can be comprehended in 
all its richness only if the translator has access to the cultural codices of community. However, in the absence of well-documented audiovisual recordings, the performative aspect of Lombarda life, the translator would struggle to con come to terms with the dynamics of power and resistance embedded in those narratives. Current studies on translation, particularly those of Dalit, Adivasi literature, cannot evade these recent re uh, theory of experience. The tones, gesture and memories evoked by each of these oral narratives can only be decoded and represented by those who share the lived experience of community. Very closely linked to the question of representation is the issue of experience. Gopal Guru offers a definition of experience and a more nuanced understanding of lived experience. A quote, what is lived experience? What are the elements that constitute lived experience? And what is the relation between lived experience and theories about this experience? What exactly the nature of lived experience? What makes lived experience unique only to the community or individual who lives it? What does the word lived add to experience?" Unquote. Ironically, writers of folk, Dalit and Adivasi studies often limit their understanding to observable and historical, historically available aspects while more nuanced and culturally significant elements of everyday life, discourse, identity, and resistance escape representation. Professor D.B. Knight's work on the art and literature of Banjara Lombardas is exactly the kind of work that subscribes to a historical understanding of the tribal subject. The Banjara community is one of, of the many Indian communities which are, all, which are most known for their various color ornaments, bangles, and dresses in colorful cars. Their habituation, which is always away from the village, is known as Tanda. Many questions remain unanswered. For instance, in what ways Lombarda have the Lombarda cultures interacted with modern style and technology of music? One must firstly question uh, one must firstly the question, the requirement or a desirable discipline such as folk studies. That is what makes this paper uh, so interdisciplinary. The focus on Nayak's work is not only to make visible the kinds of work that different Adivasi intellectuals have done, taking themselves and their communities as subject. It also helps us to understand the ways in which Adivasi intellectual is also entrenched in disciplinary limitations. The work of an Adivasi intellectual is also shaped by disciplinary requirements. This is a significant understanding for this paper. I also find myself in a completely different kind of cultural domain vis-a-vis -vis the modern Lombarda community. All festivals are no longer practiced the way he counts them. His work deals with the Adivasi communities such as the Lombarda have also displayed an immense self of self-determination and self-criticality in under undergoing a protracted process of self-reform. I note that since the, since I note that. Since the late 90s, leaders emerged from the community have had a significant role to play in rearticulating Lombarda history, culture, sociality, and the and in terms of focused technology of the self. This, this enables us ask, to ask further questions. Are Lombardas completely comfortable with their ascribed self-image as animists, forest dwellers, brown criminal tribes? exotic practitioner, gypsies, nomads, etc. Are there conditions under which Lombardas have consciously given up on their ascribed identity? I would pose this uh, question, what is getting then translated into culture if this is being done? Then I would like to move uh, into the next step wherein uh, um, after A.K. Ramanujan, very recently most of the Vachanakaras on the whole, who have not been included in this particular book, which is quite popular, uh, are translated into English. But who are getting this translated into English and who is commissioning the translation as such? Um, and then by the end of it, I would uh, conclude by saying, uh, caste and Dalitness in association with the gender representation, what is happening with that? And um, then what is the Dalitness? 
or the politics attributed to the representation, represented politics and in turn how the politics of representation represents the poetics. These are the four phases in which I would like to go now. Translation is a choice, interpretation, an assertion of taste, a betrayal of what answers to one's need, one's envy. And he also calls vachanas as religious lyrics in Kannada. Um, when you understand a certain genre, a certain expression as a religious lyric, then again the next question is which religion, what kind of lyric is it? When the first time the Brahmanical stance was questioned or contested uh, and uh, there was a call for equality, um, whatever the reason was, uh, it could be the, um, uh, it's very easy to uh, talk about Bijjala, uh, like, uh, see there are various kinds of translation of the period itself into plays, for example, Girish Karna does it in the play, uh, Chand Chandrasekhar Kamba does it in the play in Kannada. The Kannada is full of representation and translations of vachana experience experience of the vachana period, the 12th century period. Uh, I don't want to call this as the Veera Shaiva uh, movement or the uh, Lingayat movement as referred by A.K. Ramanujan uh, because later on, uh, ornament, learning privilege, religious literature, literary because religious, great voices of a sweeping movement of protest and reform in Hindu society, witnesses to conflict the ecstasy in the gifted mystical men etc, etc, etc. And he uh, compares it to vachanas are also our psalms and hymns. You know, the way he is uh, uh, looking at vachana is exactly as a piece of religious text when he refers it to the psalms. Uh, uh, and there are many 140 psalms uh, uh, in uh, the vachana movement. Uh, um, I mean, uh, sorry, I was just referring to psalm number 140. Now, Thematically typical of Vachana tradition, uh, what is the theme of Vachana tradition? And where does, I would like to read some of the uh, translations. And these are the translations by O.L. Narubhushan Swami and uh, uh, commissioned by uh, uh, Basava Samiti, which I will come uh, later. Aya, once bespoken to a customer, I will not be bespoken again. If I did, they would strip me naked and slaughter me. The sweetness of the sugar cane, unless the inside is uncovered, the pollution of caste is not lost. Unless the trust in Ishta is firmly seen, the pollution of stone is not lost. And uh, a specific portrayal of Dalitness is floated with while the canonization of Dalit literature and this overrules all other aspects of it. The movement towards with the socio-political motivated literary movement got initiated, gets stagnated with the specificities of this kind of representations. How does the representation of the caste and the Dalitness, uh, representation of the caste, outcasts, travel into the gender representations? So here I would, um, we have uh, another uh, wonderful poet, Mudna um, Chinnaswami from Kannada. And um, uh, this is a poem by a very young uh, uh, Dalit poet who is no more, N.K. Hanumantaya, which I had translated. Yeah, with this I would like to say that a new mode of reading the vachanas, sans the high caste Hindu perspective itself alone, is extremely essential and uh, 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 needed to sustain the current politics of the marginalized. Thank you. I see a qualitative difference. In, you use rightly, I, for me, the term rewriting because if you look at the 23 editions, so whatever his book is on film, Marathi is, and uh, I know this because, know this in the sense, every time it has changed. And if you look at the original diaries of Tamudar, and the way, uh, you know, because I did the translation for of those diaries for Gyan, um, so I know from the original handwritten things, what he had actually said. And later on, if you look at the way Damu and Suna's relationship develops, it's a very intensely romantic. It's not there in the original at all. It's completely different. 
and you know he's talking about I mean, whatever was happening in Mumbai at the time. Tilak died, and there was a strike by workers, and all kinds of things were happening. And this develops only on an intensely companionate marriage, which is based on very romantic love relationship between, you know, a young man and his equally dreamy but very strong kind of a woman who is his wife, which is not there in the text. So how do you account for this? Is it rewriting? Is it a completely imaginative, fictional representation of what uh, Damu and Sona have lived? Then why is he calling it? Um, you know, my father's still because it's not his father's. <laughs> I mean, I think, he yeah, I mean, only he can answer the question. No, but how do you place it? Yeah, so I, I, I was just right. wondering whether it's to do, again, in taking it to a bit to his personality, in the sense that, of course, it's a rewriting. It's it's like, as you said, uh, there's nothing of that in the original. He, he's been changing, but I'm wondering whether he himself has been going up uh, the social ladder, the economic ladder, his, say, say the way in which even political stands have changed. In the original book, uh, his father is a staunch Ambedkarite. And uh, whereas a person like Rang Rao doesn't go into Ambedkarite movement or takes any political stance. You know, the way a movie Hollywood producer thinks of the what is going to sell. Okay, uh, my question is to uh, Mamkhan Sakhar. This uh, debate about the religious uh, or secular, how do you look at a literature? Something which uh, intrigues me a lot is that uh, pre-19th or early 19th and even earlier than that, those centuries, we had a number of syncretic, resistant, breakaway religious sects which fought both Islamic hegemony as well as Brahminical hegemony through religion. But lately in the 20th century, we find that those are being, either they've been appropriated by Hinduism as is happening over here, or we are moving towards a more secular kind of uh, a discourse when we are speaking of resistance. What do you, I mean, the organizations associated with religious institutions are commissioning this. You know, not the secular, uh, uh, whatever you say, you know. Then how do we deal with it? Otherwise, I wouldn't have, uh, I can read in Kannada. Somebody wouldn't have got Surya Sangave or somebody else, you know. Or, uh, and, but again, there are many, many translations which are coming out. They are circulating within the Kannada spheres. They are supposed to go beyond that. You know, with these religious institutions, funding and uh, commissioning and uh, uh, printing books and uh, taking care of everything. Uh, but where are they going? Referring back to an imagined secular state of 12th century. We really don't know what it was. Uh, and when we imagine that and want to uh, refer to that, uh, I think it's extremely essential from people or the, uh, the communities or the groups outside these non-secular sectors start to start working towards that. Delhi writers stick to writing in English, then they would be writing to the more global audiences again with the, the eye on the market and the West. So, would there be a danger of the loss of authenticity in that? That is something which I would like to discuss. And secondly, to Mohan, you have presented a visual image of an actress doing the role of that tribe. Okay. So, that is a part of the performance, I believe. But uh, what was the objective in presenting those images here? I took only uh, uh, Nandita Das because the way they, uh, uh, the director portrayed in the movie is something very different from what is the actual uh, history or the actual story. But still, that story or uh, the, the, uh, the Lombard Asimesh never uh, showed any result after that movie also. But this is not something, something that I am focusing on these visuals, but I just wanted to show you who are these Lombardas? You were saying about um, uh, typicality and about translation. What we always forget, and uh, for this I would like to say that there's a uh, book by Hira Singh uh, in 2012, which is called Recasting Caste, where he looks at caste not as a social problem, but as a, a problem of political economy. And that we should never lose sight of. 
you know the idea of political economy and how that has been responsible for caste so when we do translation or when dalits are writing in english or or there is a danger of them being marginalized as as a certain kind of writer yeah. the english the women writer which we always find problems with so so how who controls the modes of production what is the intention behind producing and the like there are, there are some stories or there are some things in translation and regional vernacular languages but it's not that somebody or the main uh, mainstream literature will dominate them they are, they are not thinking this and that's where satyanarayana brought to recently like in main, mainstream publishing uh, publishing house writing from Hunter College and an MFA from the City College of New York in filmmaking. Maybe you will also know that he shot several experimental documentaries and narrative shorts. His films were screened at various film festivals, Berlin, um, Berlin International Film Festival, BFI London Lesbian Gay Film Festival, Montreal World Film Festival and other major festivals around the globe. Silver Country Board in Mumbai, um, Silver Dread Prize, etc. I cannot name them all because he's got so many. Um, a few more words, please bear with me. A few more words uh, before giving the floor to Jan so that you can understand the reasons, personal and academic, behind the Pillar Buddha being the film that was chosen for this fourth conference on the HRC Research Network series. As I have already hinted at um, earlier on, I'm not a specialist in Dalit literature, not even in South Asian studies like Nicole, but as a Caribbeanist, I had to get interested in Indo-Caribbean studies. And I also embarked on this, on the editing of the, the collection of academic critical essays on Dalit literatures. Uh, and you've got the flyer in your conference pack. So, um, after three years um, um, of hard work, in fact, there was a volume that was uh, put together, a volume of collected um, critical academic essays on Dalit pictures, and uh, it's forthcoming in, in August, and it was edited with Joshiel Abraham. The reason why I want to mention Joshiel is that it is um, Joshiel who was instrumental in bringing Papilio Buddha to my attention. Um, I hadn't known the film before, so he mentioned the, um, um, the film and he helped with the contact that was originally made with the producer uh, of the film, Prakash Bari, and then eventually uh, with Jayan. So it's all connected. Um, and um, um, Joshiel has not been able to make it to the conference for very precise very precise reasons uh, I am aware of, but I'm, and I'm really sorry he has been prevented from, from coming, but in a way, he is here as well uh, with us. If you, uh, if you were not here, you would still be in India, uh, busy with the editing and the post-production of the film, of the, the next film, in fact, that you have, um, the shooting is, uh, is over. Um, but so thank you so much for taking the time and for keeping to your, uh, to your word and not answering. Uh, you're coming because this may well have happened so busy you are. This question about the audience thing, I mean, do, how do you actually relate to the different types of audiences because the, the film has been shown in many different countries, in many festivals, to very different kinds of audiences. Uh, so is it something that is positive you know, for you? Is it something that, um, that causes, you know, creates Difficulties for you, or do you strive on? In fact, um, um, okay. So this would be my first um, question. But of course, you may. Thank you. Um, thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you, Nicole and Duncan, and, uh, for inviting me here. And uh, I'm so glad to be here. And to look scholars here, and we're done for you guys. Probably, uh, probably a here. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to be here and uh, to get a situation in India uh, the people 
here, this corner, uh, we need to do the whole image, uh, double that me. And uh, this film, um, some of you watch the film. I never talk about the film before uh, the screening. Usually I was, uh, I uh, answer the questions uh, from the audience. But, uh, but uh, in this case, um, I have to, um, why I make, uh, made this play, you know, I have to explain a little bit about that. Uh, I'm coming from Canada, I'm from the there. You know, I left uh, uh, Canada like I was 20 years old, and I personally go back to Canada. Uh, in particularly, uh, there are situations uh, in India, uh, it varies in each state, uh, especially Canada, uh, of course, uh, it is different from other states. Uh, a slight difference. As you really, um, so caste system is one of the poisonous, one of the policies, uh, tool of oppression ever given beings in life. As being people of Indian descent and people coming from South Asia on the subcontinent, <coughs> we have that burden on our back. It's kind of a huge scar on the face of uh, humanity. Uh, if you compare it to other uh, systems uh, around the world, uh, the victims of caste atrocities for, for the last million are uh, for taking a number or um, the, the intensity of the, the pain and torture inflicted upon people. Um, like trans Atlantic slave trade is a baby. Uh, in front of the, uh, the hugeness of the caste system. In particularly in Kerala, Kerala people um, live uh, in a self congratulatory mode. Uh, we brag about we elected the Communist Party uh, first in power, uh, as at least in, in, in Russia, we do the ballot votes. Uh, we have 100% literacy that we claim, and fully empowered uh, females. And we uh, have to project something called the Kerala Model Development, uh, and that also we are uh, back about. The so called left to progressive Kerala. Uh, modern uh, discourse has been going around the world in the last two decades. Uh, one of the pioneer Kerala model uh, anthropologist from the United States, we all know that most of you know Richard Frankie was one of the uh, great propagators of that. And later, um, the Pulaya, uh, Pulaya community is one of the prominent Dalit community. Um, was he belongs and he started um, an organization and that movement was very prominent uh, at that time. Later, this entire uh, the Dalit, um, all Dalit movements are taken by uh, the liberal middle class left leaders. And then, but then we, we, we don't see any authentic Dalit leaders because all um, the social uh, movements are uh, taken by, led by uh, left intellectuals, uh, middle class intellectuals. And uh, Communist Party, uh, CPI, and uh, later CPIM, and CPI, and the other French Maoist elements, uh, we can see that they are, they are uh, really uh, the liberators of Kerala uh, society, especially uh, Kerala um, Dalit communities uh, uh, or subaltern uh, movements only. They are self proclaimed liberators. But in the 90s, in early 90s, we can see that first authentic uh, Dalit voice, uh, an Adivasi voice, uh, head from Western Guards, especially from Vaina Utanya. It's a female voice, C.K. Janu, uh, is an indigenous leader, the capital of and started a uh, squad there, and the first occupied uh, government office movement was initiated. 
then uh, the government promised um, a lot of uh, demands they put forward, but they never keep up. Then uh, Adivasi uh, Gautra Sabha first um, evoke um, so-called UN Charter of 1948, um, that uh, uh, autonomy of indigenous communities, and India is one of the signatory of that uh, uh, chart, charter. And uh, they declare autonomy of Mutanya, the Western Guards. They start to declare that is autonomous Adivasi land. And uh, there was a resist thousands of families squatted there, and the government uh, started to uh, plan to evacuate them, and uh, there was one of the Congress government there, uh, they um, forcefully evacuated. There was um, a couple of people died in that moment. That's the first Adivasi OIS, uh, Delit OIS. Uh, Delit is a pan, uh, is kind of umbrella term. Uh, we are hearing that there's a first land struggle happening. Why not? Then you can see that uh, nature, there is Chengara struggle in central Kerala. Uh, and then under the leadership of uh, Laha Goval, is one of the Dalit leaders, who started at, uh, the biggest uh, squatting movement, very different from other uh, Dalit movements, especially um, Congress and Marxist Party. And uh, we have 25,500 Dalit colonies in Canada. That is 99% of the people is totally segregated, the Dalit people living there. That colony is at the traditional muscle pool of Marxist party, RSS, now Shiva Sena, now you can say Hanuman Sena, even a lot of Hindu fundamentalist fringe organization, even <coughs> Benjamin Katari, uh, we have, have Dalams there and um, uh, in these colonies. But the new DHRM group, they are more militant Ambedkarite Buddhist people, they start to go to uh, these colonies, start, start to convert um, uh, the Dalit groups uh, into uh, Buddhism, and also they are against subcasteism. And we have, among the Dalit groups, a fiercely practicing caste system in Kerala. Pulayas is a prominent caste of Ayyengarvi. It has three major subdivisions. There is Kuda Pulaya, Pal Pulaya, and Vallayama Pulaya. Uh, Palpulaya never going to eat or drink from Kodapulaya's house. And then the, the intercaste marriage, inter subcaste marriage is impossible. And next, uh, next to hierarchy is Parayas. And the Parayas are subdivisions. And then Kuravas. And they introduce, uh, they take a fashion state of jeans uh, and a black shirt. Uh, and uh, generally noted uh, male and female who start to uh, wear the same jeans and black shirt. And this, this movement portrayed us in a uh, terrorist organization. And uh, in 2007, there was a killing happened in Workala. And um, there was, uh, actually, they have torture chambers. Uh, it's even Dick Cheney will be ashamed of the torture method that we developed in Kerala, especially there is a particular station, police station called Katinakulam in Toronto district. Interview people, the, the, uh, the um, victims of these atrocities. And uh, uh, that I integrated into the movie. And also, you all probably know the case of Chitraleha, the people from me flew here. Chitraleha's issue was a huge thing in there. Chitraleha is an auto driver who was. Um, uh, of course, transcript the bound, bound, social boundaries, the social roles. is a dominated male profession auto driver, a Delhi woman from Kannur district. And um, uh, her story is also integrated in this film. So what I did, I just generate these testimonies and create a narrative out of it. And uh, superimpose in the historic, the history of the Delhi land rights movement uh, for last two decades. So uh, the narrative is um, fictional in detail, but in, in a larger background, that's the technique, uh, a strategy I used in the film. And uh, um, I think this is a long introduction for the film. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was uh, interesting. So then after the movie, we can discuss and go details. Yeah.
yes. Um, because you were talking about narrative, so um, can you maybe say a few words about Karen Pekudan's two autobiographies? Because in fact there were two autobiographies, uh, and this morning, I mean, we've been you know, speaking about the rewriting and the different angles. In fact, one person can address a different, you know, target a different audience uh, for Jadav's, you know, outcast. I mean, with the, the, the same case. So, would it be the, the, the case of um, writing, you know, the kind of another version through film, you know, of autobiography, or how does it work? You know, how do you position the film narrative compared to Kevin Bukodan's two autobiographies? Yeah. Uh, Kalen Pokoren, uh, most of the people, scholars from India probably uh, know Kalen Pokoren very well, and he has two biographies, uh, two autobiographies. Kalen Pokoren was born in 1932, I think. Uh, he was uh, an agrarian slave uh, in Kanu district, and uh, he went to school like uh, at the second grade, and at the age of nine, he ran away from the field and joined the Israeli media. Uh, and he was part of the scandal. Um, and uh, Kalim Pukudan was um, feel so discriminated, and he has to be uh, even the party classes uh, you go to committees, he go to, and he get kind of separate cups to drink, and uh, he has to wash his own plate, and he has to get the kitchen area food. This is happening in his sisters. And uh, he gradually um, um, withdrew from the party and quit party. In the 80s, he started a movement. Environmental movement uh, in Kano district. Uh, in any other films, uh, in Indian film industry, calling, showing, whatever you call, uh, or you can see the representations uh, like um, Savannah actors at uh, the being very uh, characters. But in the narrative, there's a transgression moment there uh, that I have my own way to narrate things, and uh, Fukurin's life is kind of larger than my narrative. But the proximity of the character he is playing and him, and he's not really playing, he's just being alive. It's a great experience uh, for me as a director. <laughs> then, uh, and, uh, then before the camera turned on, I start to talk about Ambedkar and uh, gradually I warm him up and bring him to the camera. And he start to address his people. And real people, I use the most of the activity, act, activists. Uh, and the theater actors, I never see in something he translating to what means being persona. But I am mixing with the traditional actors too. And also, uh, what I am trying to do in casting of the cinema, which is what Indian cinema put in marginal, I am trying to bring center, uh, the bodies in the center. And what is in the center, I am trying to put in marginal, mm -hmm. as police officers, as district actors, and uh, as. Uh, uh, ministers and uh, guardians of all the traditional cinema actors. But the center, people about 300, uh, more people are uh, playing as Adivasis and the groups, they are playing themselves, they are the villagers of Mutanga, they are shocked. <coughs> so that is the, the politics of uh, casting of the film. And also there are South Indian actual Patna Priya, you probably know, she is kind of uh, uh, acting 30, 90 seconds in the film, she has a role of 90 seconds. And she is usually playing the central roles in, mm -hmm. in cinemas. Mm -hmm. Trying to bring a straight narrative, uh, and also several other <coughs> guests there. Mm -hmm. I'm lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To be honest, I mean, in, in a way, you have already answered, you know, some of my questions, because I, mean, I gave them to you before. And since I already spent wonderful hours with you and you'll be able to get hold of you possibly more easily for, for future questions I was wondering maybe should we give the audience yeah. uh, right now you look at it now so he's kind of very orientalistic approach of it in the uh, progress publications in Moscow I was uh, get compared to this um, work and even in Malayalam when I was in the eighth grade I happened to read these things about Marx wrote about the first Indian uh, freedom struggle, especially C, so called CPI military, the first independence movement. There's a Marxian analysis on India, it's very poor and uh, it's kind of dumb articles. Uh, right now we are prospecting in the back. But at the time, what materials have? 
when what uh, kind of materials he have access to be and here, uh, that is, he wrote a narrative and uh, it was very pop quite popular then. But that our um, uh, Marxist um, discourse, you can we never critique Marx. A second thing, of course, this all left uh, leaderships are controlled by upper caste mentality. That is uh, very clear. And also we can, so so-called Hinduism, Hindu, we have to deconstruct that. And we are, uh, now the Mamada was talking about the, the, uh, the Veera Shaiva movement and uh, I was just talking to her that retrospectively we apply Hinduism to the 10th century. Yeah. It is totally a British colonial construct and also a nationalist movement is based on so-called Indian narrative of this national narrative itself based on cultural uh, Hindu revivalist um, uh, the Hindu talk uh, narrative, Gandhi, Nehru, and if, uh, people left or right, even so-called extreme left, is there is an in, uh, intense, uh, very very um, deliberate move to bring Shankaracharya to this idealist <laughs> pantheon. Uh, that is um, Yemus 1986 article, which is uh, I can cite it, and, and there is a huge criticism within the party. Jaimini, how Charvadas, Jaimini Darshanam and uh, Charvada Darshanam is not Hinduism. Jainism is Hinduism. And Buddhism, of course, not. But the Brahminical social order was um, there, and it has always this Atma Vada, uh, which is soul theory, which is very essential for the karma theory, which is the sole rationale for the caste system, the reincarnation birth, which was challenged one of the Buddhist philosophers in the 6th century, Naranda. Actually, a transcript of that discourse is still available. Uh, the philosopher Dhritnaga challenged um, uh, this uh, Brahminical caste rational by Anatmavada, which is also, I'm going back to the source is Nagarjuna, the Madhuri Universal. Actually, this uh, Dhritnaga's argument, the first challenge about uh, against this uh, Brahminical hegemony, then, uh, and this Anatmavada is a soulless theory will negate this all kind of soul and there is no reason to reincarnate or no reason to be suffer all this um, the, the agonies and the pains of this life in order to leave reincarnate in a Brahma Yoni, Viprajanma, you know, this the Brahman. And actually that is uh, amazing. Uh, that thread of Buddhism uh, is uh, the power source, and what do you call it? In Sanskrit we call it or something. It is kind of uh, uh, a springboard uh, to shake off the yoke of so-called Brahminical caste order. That was his time, uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar trying to do. And uh, this Marxism, uh, he, he don't even want to be a communist, or it is not even thinking of. He always a constitutionist. He was always a man of law. I mean, he's kind of different. Uh, personality. You know, it cannot be a kind of uh, you must know where I start. Can I? There was, sorry, there was one question. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, how do you reconcile your roles as a social activist and a creative filmmaker? And why did you choose this particular medium? Is it for international or intranational? Some change that you want to bring about? Oh, well, first of all, I'm not an activist. No? I don't want to be an artist. That's a huge responsibility. I'm an artist. Uh, and I'm an artist, I'm a storyteller. Uh, I am, I just, uh, I'm a poet. I start to, when I end up in New York, I write in Malayalam, and uh, nobody understands me. And I translate my poems and go to uh, New York in Poetry Cafe and go to New York Cafe and uh, translate. Uh, I, I start to read my poems, they laugh at me. What the hell is that? I think uh, I created the French poem in Malayalam and I cannot recreate that aesthetic environment in English. And it was so sad for me. I'm calling myself a poet. I think I'm a poet. And I'm living uh, uh, in a society, especially a creative writing student, undergraduate student in Ajahn Hunger College. And, um, um, and uh, I, it's very hard time to translate myself outside. I'm just. Uh, I realize myself, no, I'm just a storyteller. And whatever the medium, you're a talker, but you have to accommodate the questions yeah, as sorry. well. Okay. <laughs> 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 so just to, it, this seems to be some kind of an embrace.
generation that, you know, there is a really kind of a vertical rift between Ambedkar and the Marxists. Yeah. Now, when Ambedkar started organizing uh, people, the depressed class suspicion, for instance, or the labor uh, uh, organization, the flag was raised. You know, there is a whole, there are 29 Darshanas, as we call it. So probably we need to locate the discourse properly in this context, rather than, you know, use the term Hinduism in a very, I don't think that that's a misnomer for me. All of these ideas, I think they have to put into a perspective and look at it uh, from a distance as well. Because what happens is then we mix up current issues, uh, and one of the current issues is what we've been talking about, uh, you know, the rise of the RSS and the Saffron Brigade, as we call it. And then uh, we're very critical about this uh, aspect. I'm not saying we should not be critical of the traditions that we've got of political developments, etc. But we also need not, should not ignore the kind of danger that has been posed by the Saffron's uh, of all uh, use. When I'm, when I'm talking about Saffron's, I also include uh, urban and uh, rural space and Gandhi's grammar Saraj idealized to go there. And uh, I'm just going back on this quote and uh, caste system uh, is post scientific social order and uh, if somebody tried to get rid of caste they are trying to get rid of India which is written by Gandhi in uh, one of his religion and, and also we can see that what Ambedkar was facing uh, Ambedkar was facing um, the challenges of modernity at the same time of what Industrial revolution being the slums and the, uh, and what the Marx and the horror of capitalism in that context the Marxism was working in that context fiercely about this he was critiquing me why I was hard on Gandhi and um, he says that uh, he Gandhi changed that the first his idea was that even Catholicism is mimic uh, in making these monks orders and uh, actually they inspired from Buddhism and I can just uh, uh, take that route from how Dharma Goda was smuggled into Mount of Ceremonies yes. in New Testament, all, all kind of yes. thing. Now that you're right, absolutely right. There is no no solution. I am not idealizing uh, any kind of ideology. And, and the last two days was a conference. Philosophy, where I was trying to ask why is it that Indian philosophers have always been silent mm -hmm. on the question of caste? It's always been left to sociologists, social anthropologists, everybody else among the Indian intellectuals, but not philosophers. And so, so this, that, uh, and I kind of slightly disagree with on the question of America being only a man of law. I mean, his philosophy of Hinduism is definitely a, a, an attempt to understand the text. It's so, so important to, to question philosophically the other things. So otherwise, it just, so I'm very, very This is a great question, and uh, you evoke a very important point. Uh, actually, there was caste, rational, and uh, philosophically contested throughout the history. We have to be like this kind of things. But India have this kind of genuine hypocrisy always practiced. If you go philosophically, we are divine creatures, amazing philosophy, very inclusive. But we include people, and we we are very polyphonic and everything, very inclusive that we say. But we are very exclusive. Casteism is very exclusive. And how we effectively control the reproductive system of females. And this endogamy is very essential for caste existence. Still, in so-called extended late capitalist India, whatever you call it, they very strictly practice this, um, uh, this endogamy. There's very much, uh, uh, very much um, interested in controlling vagina. And uh, uh, that is essential for, uh, there's a biological reason for the existence of caste now. Uh, and that is very nice. Uh, you, uh, and uh, I didn't uh, avoid that it is always that the philosophically confront caste. And India has kind of very kind of uh, polyphonic uh, culture and uh, for the name of Hindu talk, uh, we cannot be uh, reframed as any Semitic religion yes. as a, uh, that, that is kind of monolithic India and the very concept of this uh, India as a nation itself problematic for me.
Shubot has been uh, tested by Joy Deep, my friend. So, I just conquered this way uh, when uh, Kuranji writes that my primary aim is the liberation of the Dalits. The nature of my literature consists of a rebellion against the suppre suppression and humiliation suffered by the Dalits. And we might remind of the words of Wang Kerry. Sakshi Puram was first published in Marathi in the late 1980s and the Hindi translation was issued soon after in 1991. In the author's preface to the Hindi translation, Chavan says, and I quote, This is not an imaginary play. This is the true representation of an actual event. I have made a small attempt to present in dramatic form an analysis of the causes that were present at the root of an event that occurred in 1981. I believe that the decision by the Dalits of Meenakshipuram in February expressing the dissatisfied reaction of people living a life worse than those of slaves. The position of perspective from which he writes, as well as the Ambedkarite aesthetics on which the play is based. The Dalits living on the periphery of the village, the upper caste Hindus living in the village, the Muslims who live at the other end of the village, and finally, members of the local administration, including the police, who come in from the district headquarters. And that is also behind my writing. In other words, Writing is the weapon in my arms. Those activists in Maharashtra who are working in the name of and according to the thought of Baba Sahib Ambedkar and Mahatma Pule, sometimes they're writers too, poets too, playwrights too. Among the people involved in this social movement, in this political movement, there are many writers also. In other words, we have a double role. We cannot say that our job is to simply write. We have to think about the effect on society of whatever we write. Chavan's work as playwright is thus part of an activist literary tradition. As Nikola <coughs> asserts in his Towards an Aesthetic of Dalit Literature, this literary tradition is characterized by the twin objectives of affirmation and negation. Chavan describes this double process in his preface quote, between the rejection of Hinduism and acceptance of Islam as a viable option in this play, there exists a whole experience of denial of the humanity of relation of caste, as well as his well-known statement of 1935, quote, I was born a Hindu, but I shall not die a Hindu, unquote. There is, of course, one difference. After much deliberation, Dr. Ambedkar opted to convert to Buddhism to Buddhism, whereas in Sakshipuram, after um, consistent with the actual event of 1981, the religion of choice is Islam. In a dramatic departure from the original event of Meenakshipuram, as well as Dr. Ambedkar's action, however, the play ends inconclusively. This open-ended nature of the play is, I believe, related to Chavan's views about Dalit literature and in particular Dalit theatre. Earlier in this paper and in the title, I have referred to Sakshi Puran as a thought play. That description is very much related to how Chavan conceives of the role and purpose of Dalit literature. The second one is who has produced the play and where is it being staged already? Um, and the third is, um, yeah, like as you said, the problems of translating uh, the, uh, the culturally rooted, the text which is visual, uh, not verbal. So, uh, if at all it is translated and and then again retranslated into a visual text in English. <coughs> I just want, I'm curious about the relationship between the Marathi visual text, the Marathi verbal text, English verbal text, which is which has to be a visual text, otherwise it fails. Sure. Uh, even before I can hand it, uh, uh, and the version I have in front of me is draft number six, <laughs> and uh, and I have still not given it to Ramnath himself. 
you know, at least in Western translation theory, there's so much of, you know, this, this kind of fear that the translator will somehow be, you know, unduly influenced by the author, that the translation itself is yet another work and shouldn't be so, you know, sort of, it shouldn't be under the purview of the author itself. And yet I feel like, of the author of the original, that, that is. But I feel like in the case of, of Dalit literature, in some ways this then answers the question, Georgie, that you brought up about can a non-Dalit translate Dalit literature? And I think the answer is yes in collaboration. And that collaboration is extraordinarily not only critical for producing an accurate and a good translation, but in the case of Dalit literature specifically, which is a very specific case, it is an ethical responsibility of the translator and an extraordinary opportunity that we have as translators because, for the most part, we have um, the play of ideas. That's a tradition. And there are lots of plays. Tata Bhagat is another very important major playwright who does that. G.P. Deshpande is another who belongs to the other experimental theatre uh, group. So, you know, that's so probably, yes, because if you can, yeah, that's it. And I came across Mark Fried writing on translating Eduardo Galliano. And he says, um, the relationship between author and translator can be discomforting. Translators chew over every phrase for nuance, sound, and tone. We sift through the many layers of meaning look for every angle, intended or not. Not infrequently, authors return the favor, reading our draft translations with a jeweler's loop. Um, and then he says, Small wonder we translators prefer our authors dead and buried. <laughs> <laughs> So this is just a comment I wanted to make, nothing to do with any author or something. But this, uh, uh, when you talked about going back to the author and sitting with him, we do look some phrases, some words which are foreign to us, was not able to translate it. So, so we do go about it, but so I don't know how it works by going back to the author. I'm sure it's a fulfilling exercise, but uh, just wanted to recount Mark Fried's experience. <laughs> No, very briefly, these are such important texts. Um, and I think when you hear some of the papers, some of the problematics actually, you know, of not being careful about how we go about this business. So understanding, first of all, spending enough time to understand where this text is coming from. And the time I spent with Jawan that I mentioned. Around, shrouded in the mist of chilling stories of evil spirits lurking there. 
all of these would strike one's heart cold with tear. Okay, now, um, Urmila says that she's grown up with uh, uh, these women who have been worse. Uh, did I say what the question Why did she write her autobiography? That was the question. I mean, what led her to write the autobiography? Touched with was their ability to laugh at suffering. And I think that's a very, very important uh, point for her to begin because she wanted to bring that ability to laugh at suffering, uh, uh, which is something we should not incidentally find in the main writers. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sharabhima. <coughs> but uh, that's really a defining feature of uh, women's writing here. <laughs> I think I'm going to tell you that 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 So, um, when she started looking at Buddhism and got familiar with Buddhism and she started reading up on that, she came across lots of women. I think she was on her journey to construct a tradition internally. Uh, that is what she seems to be doing all this time. Loads and loads and loads of women whose names have never been documented in uh, the hegemonic history, even in the Dalit history. Apart from this, her engagement with the history of the Dalit movement, another very important theme in her writing, and especially in the later part of her career as a writer, has been uh, sexuality. And uh, believe me, she's written some wonderful stories exploring into the issue of Dalit woman's sexuality, which is a big no-no in the traditional kind of a discourse. Yes, to protect Dr. Ambedkar. Now, this is something which is a completely different terrain of the Dalit movement which had remained invisible. And then she thought that, uh, she uh, takes lots of names, like uh, yeah. controlling yeah. the crowd, etc. Like, yeah, and controlling the crowd, yeah. etc. But then that is what got her interested into this project of tracing the tradition of uh, women's contribution to the making of history. Now, after conversion, there are big stories. But many uh, women are missionaries, and uh, some people, uh, women have operated themselves because operation, family planning operation, because for the movement, for the movement. The Shilsena goons came and did so many, so much agitation and threats and everything, saying that this story will have an extraordinarily bad influence on young and innocent minds, <laughs> you know, and finally they had to take the story out of that collection. Uh, it, it was there, I mean, they didn't tear it out, but that was not supposed to be the prescribed syllabus. Anyway, yeah. so my question to her is, um, how do you write about these things? Why do you write about these things? How do you receive the uh, reactions to this? Uh, uh, Mala ek swatache confidence ani dalit movement mule swatache confidence ala. Ani tachwala laka hai dalit mala swatache jano dalit bahi na bolna pahi ji. Ha apne the gaana padho ta. Tu bolegi mu kolegi tabhi zamana badlega. Ek apne the gaana to tya bolat bahi na bolna pahi ji. Bahi gopper aate bolu bahi wat tu patya chalu ta. Ani purus the patya chal karala abdi mukhe rata. Ani kahi ek laga ni purus tangla. Ramdas Atoli sir ke drust, 
ज्या शिवसेनेने बाबासाहेब म्हणजे काय तर भोपळ्यावर चष्मा लावला की झाला बाबासाहेब इतकी क्लोज तऱ्हेची त्याने कॉमेंट्स केलेली आहे आणि बाबासाहेबांचं येऊ नये म्हणून अनेक तऱ्हेच्या घटना आहेत ज्या सांगायला आपल्याला नथिंग बट द ब्रॅमिनायझेशन ऑफ द दलित मुवमेंट अँड दॅट इज वन ऑफ द बिगेस्ट चॅलेंजेस दॅट इज कमिंग अप बिकॉज टॉकिंग अबाउट सर्टन थिंग्स अँड नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट सर्टन थिंग्स इज नॉट ऑन फॉर द राईटर फॉर हर going to the root of the matter seems to be uh, the major task and therefore uh, the society in which we are living right now in india especially in maharashtra where we have uh, any anyway, um, <laughs> and for her this poses both political challenges as well as social challenges as well as artistic challenges as a writer because this is what now we have to counter and that she will keep on doing all her life that is things to be uh, spoken and shared but uh, the time uh, constraints and the uh, session far changla jali thank you <laughs> and uh, yeah and uh, with a yeah. little bit of my marathi i could understand and you I understand like you are not speaking yeah please do one one more hug yeah i i i i food arrangements for tomorrow there isn't a meal as part of the conference tomorrow but i've been making inquiries and there is somewhere uh, on campus that you can walk to which has i'm told pretty good and pretty inexpensive uh, food available until 8 o'clock tomorrow evening i won't say any more now i'll say some more about that tomorrow but just in case you were wondering Thank you for uh, having me here, and uh, <laughs> Judith, Nicole, Tucker, and uh, the university staff, and David, the projectionist back there. And thank you. Uh, I will be here after we can have 